Welcome to Stat Masters, where we teach you how to use Player Profiler to win at fantasy football and better evaluate players. My name is Aaron Stewart, and I'm a senior analyst for Player Profiler, and my co-host is Chris Bonagura, a fantasy intelligence network analyst for Player Profiler. Chris, who are we talking about today? We're going to talk more about a concept and, of course, players. But before we get into that, Aaron, do you mind letting me know your uh, social security number and mother's maiden name? Uh, I'm just going to the bank re- real quick. Do you mind? Oh, of course. I mean, this this seems legit and you're trustworthy. Yeah, let me give you all that information. Why do you ask? Um, Just to steal your identity. I mean, just, you know, going to the bank. Actually, I was asking more so to give you fraudulent fantasy football advice. Um, But first, I had to steal your identity to do so. Because uh, there's a lot of fraudulent fantasy football advice out there. A lot of fraudulent fantasy football advice last week. And uh, we're going to run through it. And we're going to help everyone identify fraud. Especially with players like Travis Etienne and DeAndre Hopkins. Who have been hot button names around Twitter and on player blurbs this last week. So the thing about poor fantasy football takes. There's a lot of different ways people do it. But one of the most common ones, especially that you'll see on Twitter, is non-news. And that is to say a piece of news and or information that is presented to us that people then use to make changes in their strategy. But the news did not actually provide us any new information. And it happens pretty often. Have have you heard about Tank Bigsby, Aaron? Hank Bigsby? You mean third round running back draft pick of the Jacksonville Jaguars? I've heard a thing or two about him, especially this past week. And I got to say, I don't like what I'm hearing here. I feel like it's a whole lot of hogwash. It's a lot of hogwash. So for any that are not familiar, uh, a, a news blurb, quote unquote, came out saying that the Jaguars expect Travis Etienne to be in more of a committee. And now Twitter has taken that as and ran with it as to say that Tank Bigsby will be a significant detractor from Travis Etienne's role and that Travis Etienne is a bad pick. Now, Travis Etienne, up until this point, has been drafted at around running back 12 on underdog. We'll look at the rankings. Currently RB12, ADP 36.7, mid to late third round pick. And he was never necessarily the best mid to late third round pick. He was certainly draftable, but a player you would have preferred to see more so in the fourth round, uh, similar to where like Najee Harris should go. And now he's certainly starting to fall after this news, but the news didn't change anything. Anything that was fringy on ETN's profile existed well before the drafting of Tank Bigsby. So Tank Bigsby is a fine player, six foot, two ten, okay athleticism, best comparable to Damian Harris. His college production is modest. Um, He's had 1,000-yard seasons, some receiving work, decent target share his junior year. He's an early declare. There's certainly a lot to like, but not really much to love. This isn't a guy that was overly propped up pre-draft, and he went as a late third-round pick. It's really tough to say that a late third-round pick is going to supplant a guy like Travis Etienne, who definitely had some disappointment last season. But the reason that it's fraudulent, when you go on Twitter and you see someone mention, oh, here's some bad stats about Travis Etienne. He's a bad player. He's untrustworthy. Here's why you should fade Travis Etienne, so on and so forth. The thing about Etienne is it's it's a back and forth profile. There's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad. You can choose to highlight the bad, but when you choose to ignore the good, it's disingenuous. Etienne probably should have never been shoved right here as RB12. It definitely made sense that he was behind the 11 guys before him, and it still kind of makes sense he's before the guys after him, but all of these guys should have been a little cheaper to boot. The problems with Etienne have nothing to do with his perceived touch comp- competition. Of course, Travis Etienne was not going to see 80% of opportunities this year. Almost no running backs do. Your best running backs see 60 to 65% of op- op- opportunities. Last year, Travis Etienne saw a 60.1% opportunity share. That's a number you would expect to grow going into his third year. His snap share wasn't necessarily that high. Now, he did get a lot of carries, 220, and he did a lot with it, 1,100 rushing yards. He got 45 targets, 
and he caught 35 of them for 316 rushing yards. His yards per reception was nine, fifth in the league, nine yards per reception. That's a very good number. He ran a good amount of routes. He didn't necessarily earn a high target share, but he did well with what was given to him. Now you look at his efficiency. He certainly had a poor juke rate. His evaded tackles could have been better. He did have, he was 12th in breakaway run rate. You want to see a little better from a guy like ETN, but he still had 16 breakaway runs. It's certainly not bad. You know, you see true yards per carries 4.6. That's very disappointing, but he was 10th in yards created, 10th in yards per touch. So there's good, there's bad. He certainly left efficiency on the table, but this isn't a player who did nothing. And people will highlight one or the other. Now, you know, Doug Peterson, history of a committee, this and that. There's a lot of concerns with ETN. He hasn't given us the full picture yet, but you look back at what he did in college. And, you know, the sophomore and junior year, he was an undeniable beast. And then there's the one thing that nobody ever brings up when they're trying to talk poorly of Travis Etienne. And that's the fact that he had a Liz Frank injury in 2021. And we talked about it last week with Rashad Bateman. We've talked about it before with Debo Samuel. The Liz Frank injury is particularly brutal for NFL skill position players. And it saps their explosiveness for the year following. Everything Travis Etienne did... The good and the bad gets the asterisk of the Liz Frank. When you put it in context of the Liz Frank, the good looks better. The bad doesn't look as bad. So then people are going to tell you that Tank Bigsby, this so-so prospect, and to Ernest Johnson, the free agent that, that, that they signed, who's also fringe, like these guys are going to come in and keep Travis Etienne from seeing his ceiling. No, if Travis Etienne is good enough to be an RB1 in fantasy football, he will be, despite Tank Bigsby. And all of the flaws on his profile and your concern about his workload, they existed coming into the offseason. The e- the Jaguars said months ago that they want to add more members of this backfield, and they were true to their word. His price tag always reflected this. And if people did think he was going to just get all the work, like we thought for Kenneth Walker until the draft, he would have been a higher pick. Kenneth Walker was a mid-second round pick who has now dropped to the fifth round. Travis Etienne was always at the end of the third round because no one thought he was going to get Kenneth Walker's workload. No one thought he was going to get any of these guys' workload. This is non-news, and everyone's acting like it's a big deal. Yeah, with Tank Bigsby, too. The one thing I do want to look at his profile is, yes, that college target share, That is, what, 91st percentile, the 15% college target share. You go down to that junior season, 30 receptions. That's great. But he only got 180 receiving yards, six yards per catch. It's not like he's an explosive pass catcher in that backfield. And Travis Etienne, in one season in the NFL, you mentioned the targets and the receptions and the receiving yards. But look... He was outside the top 20 in targets and receptions, but the receiving yards was number 15. He's an explosive playmaker in the pass catching game. Tank Bigsby's not taking that role. Tank Bigsby, Travis Etienne are identical sizes. It's eerie how similar built they are. So what does Tank Bigsby do that Travis Etienne isn't already better than him? I don't think there is anything. I think if I'm if I was to guess one thing that he might take away from ETN, maybe goal line work. There was a lot of red zone touches for ETN. He had 45 red zone touches and he only scored five touchdowns. Maybe they go, we need someone to maybe help uh, push the ball in the end zone a little bit more, a little better than ETN. That's my one guess at a role that Bigsby might take from ETN. But honestly, Bigsby is just the breather back for Travis ETN. ETN, it's remarkable what he did last year, considering the Liz Frank injury that you talked about. Because even when you come back from the injury, go to any of your trusted fantasy football physical therapists. They have the data. And when you suffer that injury and you come back, you're almost guaranteed to miss a handful of games. You're not as productive. And if those are true statements, right, then what ETN did in 2022 is fantastic. Played in all 17 games. There was one game that he injured the same foot and we all collectively held our breath. But he came back the next week and kept all the opportunity share that he had been doing with the Jaguars. Especially you look at the second half of the season, seeing a lot of 
the a lot of the work, a lot of the snap share being 75% or higher. So ETN was a bell cow, 220 carries, 35 receptions, over five yards per carry, number 10 in yards per touch. And that's with a guy that is still recovering from essentially a broken foot. So ETN now a year removed from that should be even better. And Tank Bigsby, a late third round rookie running back, is not taking any significant role from Travis ETN this season. Yeah, ETN, you mentioned the red zone. The Jaguars scored 46 total touchdowns last season. I believe it was number nine or 10 among all teams. The Chiefs led the league with 63 total touchdowns, so about 14 more. The Jaguars probably do the same or build on it. It's hard to see them be worse because they have a great quarterback and, and a very good offense. Uh, they ran in 13 total touchdowns. ETN had five of those. Trevor Lawrence had five of those, and James Robinson had three. And that month of September, when ETN wasn't getting the full snap shares, again, I mean, he was. they were still just seeing what he could do off that Liz Frank. And then he worked his way up, and they straight up traded James Robinson. And ETN missed on a few big plays where Trevor Lawrence overthrew him, and he fell short of, of the goal line once or twice. And Trevor Lawrence ran those in. He fell short on variants, things that we can't predict, non-sticky stats like red zone and and big play rate where it's it's undeterminal coin flip type chance situations that tells you whether or not this is going to happen. You know, he definitely underperformed as the running back 23 in PPR points per game last year, but he hits on a few of those plays. And our perception of Travis Etienne is wildly different and probably wrong. We probably go too far on the positive end. Right now, we're being a little too negative, and you really need one more year before you can say definitively good or bad. But the upside is still in the profile and on the sticky stats like yards per reception, yards per touch, yards created, breakaway run rate, right? He he did well on those. And he went for over 1,000 yards on 220 carries. That's exactly what you want to see. Now, in terms of another piece of news that came out DeAndre Hopkins was cut which is the most non-news of non-news I've ever heard Aaron have have you ever heard less impactful news in your life to your fantasy football take the only thing that really was surprising in all this was that he wasn't traded that he was released we knew for months right the Cardinals that finished with the third worst record in the NFL that lost Kyler Murray to a torn ACL that have objectively the least amount of talent in the NFL cross offense and defense. Why would DeAndre Hopkins play for that team? Of course he was gone. That's why two months ago in dynasty football, if you listen to the trade gods podcast, Marquise Brown was one of my trade targets because it's just common sense. The now 31-year-old receiver had no future in Arizona. So why, Chris, why is his ADP in best ball changing now that he is officially not a member of the Cardinals? It's it's complete insanity that anyone since free agency started, honestly, since the end of last offseason, would have drafted as if DeAndre Hopkins was still going to be on the Cardinals. I mean, you were saying in December, like anyone who looks at contracts looks and goes, oh, yeah. You know, Cardinals fire their coach. Kyler Murray has an ACL. Of course, this team is going to get rid of DeAndre Hopkins. There's no point in having him there. And we all knew this. We all knew knew this. And now people are going to say, oh, landing spot for DeAndre Hopkins. That's the next piece of non-news. If we look, look ahead. Landing spot for DeAndre Hopkins matters 0%. Whatever you're going to get from DeAndre Hopkins, you're going to get on any team. He's done it with Tom Savage. He's done it across from Marquise Brown. He's done it in every situation. What's going to determine whether or not Hopkins is good is age. We've already gone over aging receivers on this show. Hopkins has shown us no decline in efficiency last year. We'll look at it again briefly. You know, his efficiency metrics were, well, he didn't log enough games for it to really show, but he was still number nine in PPR points per game with 16.9. Now he's 31. There has to be concern of of his age, and I have not been loving his ADP of wide receiver, you know, 39 right now, and he's an end, he's a third, fourth turn pick. There was a brief period in the offseason where he was 
falling to the late fourth and early fifth round. And in the fifth round, you know, you take stabs on DeAndre Hopkins. It's risky to take a guy who's 31. It's not going to matter where he 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 goes. I don't care if he goes to Buffalo and Stephon Diggs is there. He'll still earn his target share if he's capable of it. I don't care if he goes to a losing team for more money and it's not Patrick Mahomes. The worst quarterback in football, Tom Savage, can still get him to be a wide receiver one in fantasy. Doesn't matter. And then you look at Marquise Brown, like you said, Aaron, who's now rising. Why? Why? We all knew DeAndre Hopkins was going to be gone. We also know that for years... Marquise Brown has been great for fantasy football. I mean, every time he plays, he's good. He has 1,000 yards in his junior year. The last two seasons, he's been top 30 in points per game. He's slacked a little bit in touchdowns, but the yards per reception, I mean, even if we just look at last year's tough because he missed games. But if you look at 2021, you know, the efficiency metrics are there. You have a lot of unrealized air yards, left a lot on, on the table, could have done more. Good in air yards, good in air yard share. He's running routes. He's participating in routes, 90.4% route participation. He earned 145 targets, 27 deep targets. It's not really much more to, to want. You know, your receiving efficiency and productivity could probably be a little better, but we certainly know that this is not a bad player. So why would we were we drafting him in the seventh round when he's always good and suddenly moving him up? It's just non-news. It's just to validate that you should have been drafting him before and you keep drafting him now, but he's not done rising, right? Marquise Brown is now wide receiver 35 at ADP of 68. A week ago, he went behind Deontay Johnson. Now he's all, all the way up to above Kadarius Tony, and I've seen him already be drafted well ahead of Mike Evans. If I had a guess, he's going to end somewhere in the range of Godwin to Ayuk. It's now going to be a pocket of Godwin, JSN, Ayuk, Marquise Brown in whatever order based on the temperament of your draft room. And it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, it does make sense. Marquise Brown should have always been that high. But if he starts to go higher than Godwin, we've gone too far. Um, He's still draftable. Just It's it, it's an ADP to watch. Uh, what other news? What other non-news have you heard, Aaron? Well, and with Marquise Brown, just real quick, is for anyone going, oh, the quarterback, the quarterback, it doesn't matter. Marquise Brown this past season, he he had a career high in slot snaps because when Hopkins missed the first six games of the season, Marquise Brown balled out. Wide receiver seven in points per game in PPR, 18.3 points. And then when Hopkins came back, Marquise Brown, that same week, had a high ankle sprain. I know six games, it's a sample size, but I think we can safely say that Marquise Brown is not just going to be running vertical routes with backup QBs unable to get him the ball. He's going to be running shorter routes. And man, he had 11, 14, 17 targets in some of those games. I don't care who's throwing the ball. Marquise Brown is going to be great, but you're right. Like Now you're too late on drafting Marquise Brown because the price is going to rise but there's another Cardinals receiver too that from that news, Rondell Moore, right? Can we talk about Rondell Moore? Because now, like his ADP. Can has we talk jumped. about Rondell Moore? I'm Can offended. You, about you haven't Moore. been talking about him more already. <laughs> I love the puns because, man, that ADP has been like a rocket ship because it, it was closer to 180. Yeah, but now is running. it like 150? I think it's it shot up more than two 160. rounds. And he Once. was down to after Hunter Renfro. Yeah. And that's it's, the one where it's like, and he started the offseason up at 150. And then he fell. And now he's back up. It's a yo-yo. It's the Rondell Moore yo-yo if we actually titled these shows. Yeah. And it's because people keep reacting instead of being proactive with their analysis because, oh, Hopkins is there and Rondell Moore is going to be a wide receiver three instead of trying to just think logically and go, there's no way Hopkins plays. Already talked about it. But Rondell Moore, he started the season injured. And this was, it was a pivotal second season. But when he came back, immediately he topped 87% snap share every game before he got hurt. He got injured in that last game. 87% snap shares key. I mean, it's common sense. You do have to be on the field in order to get targets, in order to catch passes and score fantasy points. And when he was on the field, you think they put Rondell Moore out there to block? 
No, he ran 30 plus routes in six of the seven healthy games he played last season, and he had eight plus targets in five games, scored 10 plus fantasy points in those five games as well. Rondell Moore, who's basically just going to run slot routes, it's either him or Marquise Brown in the slot. Doesn't matter who the QB is, it's going to be the safety check down option for that quarterback. And then when Kyler Murray comes back, oh baby, there's going to be some massive games for Rondell Moore, probably in the second half of the season when you're trying to get some fantasy points to make the playoffs, to compete in those tournaments. Rondell Moore, even as that ADP rises, is still still a good target. But man, I loved the slow drafts where I was still getting them around 170 to 180. Yeah, he's he's the this is the type of guy you take a shot on. You know, obviously there's not a ton on the profile. He's a little small. But like you said, he was on the field, he was running routes. He was always going to be the, the the number two. If you were going to be concerned about Rondell Moore, it had absolutely nothing to do with DeAndre Hopkins. And you'd probably be more concerned about Michael Wilson, the rookie that they drafted that could potentially play a big slot role if you wanted to be concerned about more. And the fact that the Hopkins cut is why people are now touting more. Like that's where the fraud is. It's not that Hopkins was cut. It's Hopkins was always going to be cut. It's that Moore is just good and has dealt with injuries. And he should be a fringier pick, though. You know, there's obviously a ton of risk. The biggest one just being more injuries. So I like Rondell Moore. I've always liked Marquise Brown, one of my most drafted players by exposure up to this point in, in the offseason. So looking ahead, we're not just going to give you hindsight fraud because um, that would make us frauds. And I mean, we're all frauds to to a bit, but hopefully we do a better job of hiding it. Looking ahead, tomorrow's headline, players that currently have value, that you're going to see that value evaporate as the headlines come out. The first one I think about is Brees Hall. Brees Hall right now is going at ADP 30 and he slips. I've seen him go to the later end of the third round. I'm yet to see him fall to the fourth round, but I have seen him go as late as... 310, 311. And that's very late for Brees Hall. Brees Hall started the offseason at the 2 3 turn. He now falls well into the third round. And I don't know if we've spoken about him directly on this show, but the thing about Brees Hall, we know he's a definitive stud. We know he's definitively in that Saquon Barkley, Jonathan Taylor tier of athleticism, talent, upside, and explosiveness on what projects to be a, a, a healthy run volume Jets offense. And the one concern that's dragging people down is the ACL. And the narrative on Twitter, if you type Brees Hall, you're going to see more tweets that are concerned about his ACL recovery and ACL injuries in general for, for players than you'll see positive tweets of Brees Hall's ability. The things we know for sure about coming back from ACL and Brees Hall is Brees Hall is a stud when healthy. RB1 overall in fantasy type upside. Towards ACL in week seven, but just ACL, no extended ligament or knee damage, no uh, meniscus. His timeline puts him right on track for nine months to be right around week one. Now, nine months is the average optimistic timeline. I think it's still reasonable to expect him to be given limited snaps or limited in some way in September. But there's no reason by October he can't be to full speed. And it's possible that by week one he is at full speed. But this is all information we know and all information we've had for months. We also know that historically, players that have come off the ACL quicker, like Adrian Peterson, who came off an ACL tear and had the best season of his career from a fantasy point, was right after tearing his ACL. He didn't need that year gap that everyone talks about. Typically, when you can do that, it's when you're an insane athlete. John, uh, even Saquon was really good coming off the ACL, but he dealt with compensation injuries and got a high ankle sprain. So there's, of course, risk, but there's still also a chance that Brees Hall is great. But I promise you, unless the report is of a setback, there will be a, 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 a re report come camp, come July. There's going to be a video that circulates on Twitter of Brees Hall doing some cutting drills and they're going to talk about how optimistic Robert Sala is in the timeline for the return and then you're going to start seeing Brees Hall right in the second round again and everyone's going to start talking about coming back from the ACL in nine months and and the explosive stats for Brees Hall and the receiving upside and they're going to be like look at how many times Aaron Rodgers checked it down to Aaron Jones that's Brees Hall now 
It's going to happen. Tomorrow's fraud today is Brees Hall. So just draft Brees Hall now. If you get Brees Hall in the middle of the, of the third round, count your lucky stars because come August, it's not happening anymore. And with Brees Hall, I'm actually going to mention another player, uh, Chris Godwin last season, who had a worse ACL injury than Brees Hall because he also tore the MCL as well. Normally, that's kind of a that <laughs> that's horrible news. ACL is already bad enough. But Godwin, I remember last year from personal experience, I was going, I'm not drafting this guy because ACL and MCL tear in week and 15. I, ACL and MCL it, in week 15. His in week timeline 15. was mid October is nine months. Yes. Yeah. And that time, like all logic is avoid the injury. It's super late, but the best ball lesson that I learned from that is if you're doing numerous best ball teams, you've still got to get some exposure. And best ball is kind of like the stock market, right? Buy low, sell high. If Brees Hall, if his ADP continues to fall, and now it's, it is what mid to late third round pick, you're never going to get Brees Hall mid to late third round pick. And if Brees Hall does hit, remember, if you're doing tournaments and doing numerous lineups, mid to late third round Brees Hall is so much more valuable than those teams you're competing with that drafted them late second. And those teams in the future, you mentioned it, the hype videos will come out. It happens every year when those hype videos come out and it pushes his ADP into the tail end of the first round. And the show is a spoiler alert, by the way, there's so many things that this show has successfully predicted. Like when that happens and teams are taking Brees Hall at the end of the first round, you have such a huge advantage with your mid to late third round Brees Hall than those, than those teams. And if he doesn't hit, this is why you attack those tournaments in best ball and do as many teams as possible to get a, as many combinations of players and teams that you can get. So Brees Hall, buy him, buy him. It's, it's worth taking a risk. That's how talented he is. Yeah. And this is, you know, we're going to look way ahead to next offseason. When you're an early offseason, early off season, even to mid-offseason drafter, whenever you see a scenario that you know the non-news is set to come, but people are too hesitant to react on it for whatever reason, that's when you buy. Look at Tony Pollard. Tony Pollard entered the offseason as a 3-4 turn player. You were getting Tony Pollard in the early fourth round. People were taking Pollard after Najee Harris because Zeke was still technically on the roster. But we all knew. Even if Zeke was on the roster, we all saw Zeke play. We all knew it was Pollard's season. It took cutting Zeke, and now Pollard's RB7. It's just, it's every time, and you can look at it with still current free agents. Uh, you know, me and Aaron's favorite player that we'll never stop talking about is going to be Leonard Fournette, right? Leonard Fournette is now down to 196. He, he falls by the day. How high does Fournette go the minute he gets drafted, uh, signed? And of course he's going to sign somewhere. He hasn't retired. What happens if Denver goes, Javante Williams' knee is, is completely shot, give us Leonard Fournette, now it's just Fournette and P. Ryan. How high does he go? Incredibly high. Even if he goes somewhere where there's two other running backs, he's still going to go high. What happens if the 49ers sign Fournette for depth just to be safe? He at least jumps to 150, 140, and then you stop drafting him, right? And, and then even players that haven't been cut yet, Cordero Patterson is free. Cordero Patterson is a likely cap casualty for Atlanta that could still happen post June 1st or really at any point this offseason. And even if they choose to ride out Cordero Patterson, there's still room as a receiver behind Drake London. There's a lot of pads for Cordero Patterson to be relevant. And that non-news could come where he's cut or it's, hey, this guy still has a role because he hasn't retired. You should still know Cordero Patterson's like not dead. Now he's old. He's like 32, but he's not bad. He's not, he shouldn't be free. Michael Carter is one of those guys. There was already a blurb today. Oh, Michael Carter, the coaching staff thinks he's going to get his role back. Of course he's going to get his role back. Michael Carter is the number two. He's the breather. Israel Ab Conda is not going to be better than Michael Carter. It's just not going to happen. And when the ADP goes up, because we see Michael Carter crush it in a preseason game, you're not allowed to be shocked. That's all we're saying. It's just look out for the fraud, the non-news, and just... Purchase via ADP the things that you know to be true, and you're going to see it with every position at some point, especially as players move 
The next big one is going to be Raiders players, right? Look at Michael Meyer. Michael Meyer is free. It's a great rookie tight end prospect. He's 188 overall by ADP. And Hunter Renfro. Hunter Renfro, also free. I believe he goes at 186. And right now, there is a lot of... Where is Hunter Renfro? He's so far. 177. You know, it's, oh, Jimmy G didn't pass his physical. Okay, what happens when he does pass his physical? We're going to suddenly shoot these guys back up. What happens when potentially Tom Brady's the starter if that happens, which it's not going to happen, but if it did happen, how high do these guys go? They're going to have a quarterback. People are acting like they're not going to have a quarterback. When that news comes out and Raiders receivers get higher ADPs again, you're not allowed to be shocked. If Devontae Adams starts to slip to the middle of the second round, as opposed to a one-two turn player, because he's quote unquote disgruntled with the scheme. Okay. A lot of players are disgruntled with their team's scheme. And then when he comes out and he's still a stud, not allowed to be shocked. So yeah, just keep, keep an eye out for non-news. There's a lot of non-news out there. And if people start changing ADP and adjusting their rankings because of non-news, just don't be one of those people. And the final thing I'll add on this one is I mentioned that best ball is like the stock market. Buy low, sell high. But the other thing, too, is when you do want to invest in a player, right, and that's what you're doing when you draft him to a best ball team, do your research, right? Don't rely. It's easy, but don't rely on Twitter and these little news blurbs that are like one sentence. No, like actually pull up the depth chart. I'm begging you, pull up the depth chart and just go logically. What is the thing to take away from this? Also, what do NFL teams do? I, trust me, there is no NFL story this off season that we have not seen previously in, in past seasons, right? Just try to recall what happened when a similar situation it's going to be with a different player, but the similar situation happened with a different player, a different team. What was the resolution, right? Just always remember the past. Otherwise, you're doomed to repeat again in the future. Overreactions happen every single season. Stay on top of these teams. Find your trustworthy sources. Don't go for the clickbait because it's just going to ruin not just your best ball teams, but all of your fantasy football teams. And if you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead, hit like on the video, subscribe if you're not already, comment below, let us know what you like, what you didn't like, we'll have a conversation with you. And you also need to join the Player Profiler Discord server, go to playerprofiler.com slash chat, because we do this show live, and after we finish recording, we take questions from the audience so we can help you avoid those obvious fraud news items out there. And from Aaron and from Chris, we bid you adieu until next time. Hey, you like that video? Be sure to subscribe and activate those alerts so you get notified as soon as new videos drop. And be sure to check out playerprofiler.com. We have all the tools for you to dominate every type of fantasy league. We have a draft kit, Dynasty Deluxe, data analysis, DFS dominator, and don't forget the player rankings to rule them all.